You know, ladies and gentlemen, there's many people that have been considered a dangerous writer that the public or the censors or the people involved in book promotion and sales can say this guy this guy is trouble now this guy itself may not be well known to the modern generation those probably under 30 have never heard of this guy but the people 30 and over if you ever went to uh to work at the camps if you were to went into the to the armed forces went to, out to work or was traveling on bus you had a copy of one of these books nearby he sold more books in paperback than maybe i can count hardcover as well and he also became an actor playing the character he created which is doesn't happen very often of course we have to be talking about mike hammer himself who is, who is Mike Hammer? Well, it's Mickey Spillane. Now, Mickey Spillane, born Frank Morrison Spillane in, uh, in New York uh, City uh, on March 9th, 1918, in actually Brooklyn. <laughs> no surprise there. He was an American crime novelist whose stories often featured his signature character, Mike Hammer, which has been evolving even now, 2022, from his original incarnation. Now, more than 225 million copies of his books have been sold internationally, published in many languages. Uh, I would think it's a little bit higher than that, but that's the official total now. So as a dollar each profit, he made a lot of money. Splane is also an occasional actor, once even playing Hammer himself in The Girl Hunters, which we're going to be talking about uh, uh, within this podcast. Now, Frank Morrison Spillane uh, was raised in Elizabeth, New Jersey. He was the only child of an Irish bartender father, John Joseph Spillane, and his Scottish mother, Catherine Ann. Spillane attended Erasmus Hall High School, graduated in 1935. He started writing while in high school, briefly attended Fort Hayes State College in Kansas, and worked in a variety of jobs, including summers as a lifeguard at Breezy Point, Queens, and appeared as a trampoline artist for the Ringland Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. So you knew if he's turned to writing, he would draw on a lot of the characters he was dealing with. Now, during World War II, he enlisted in the Army Air Corps, becoming a flight fighter pilot and a flight instructor. He was first stationed at the air base in Greenwood, Mississippi, where he met and married his first wife, Mary Ann Pierce, in 1945. He also met two younger writers, Earl Bozinski and Charlie Wells, who would become his protégés. Each published two hard-boiled noir novels in Splain style in the early 1950s. Now, Spillane claims that he started being published as an author of Slicks, where he was credited under house names, then went lower to the pulps, then went lower still as a writer for comic books. While working as a salesman in Gimbel's department store basement in 1940, he met Thai salesman Joe Gill, who would later found a lifetime career in scripting for my favorite comic book company, Charlton Comics. Gill told Spillane to meet his brother Ray Gill, who wrote for Funnies Incorporated, an outfit that packaged comic books for different publishers. Spillane soon began writing an eight-page story every day. He concocted adventures, adventures for major 1940s comic book characters, including Captain Marvel, Superman, Batman, and Captain America. In the early 1940s, working for Funnies Incorporated, he wrote two-page uh, text stories, which were syndicated to various comic book publishers, including Timely, which would later be Marvel. At one point, Spillane estimated he wrote 50 of these short, short stories, which were intended to fulfill a postal regulation requiring comic books to have at least two pages of text to qualify for a second-class mailing permit. While most comic books writers toil anonymously, Spillane's byline appeared on most of his prose filler stories. 26 of these were collected in Primal Spillane, Early Stories 1941-42, uh, published by Griffin Books in 2003. A new expanded uh, edition of Primal Spillane was released by Bold Venture Press in uh, 2018. The new uh, volume contained additional 15 stories, uh, including the previously unpublished A uh, Turn to the Tide. Now, he joined the United States Army Corps in December 841, the day after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Again, in the mid-1940s, he was stationed as a flight instructor in Greenwood, where he met and married Mary Ann Pierce. The couple wanted to buy a country house in the town of Newburgh, New York, 60 miles north of New York City, so Spillane decided to boost his bank account by writing a novel. He wrote the classic I to Jury in just nine days. That's like writing the Bible in two minutes. 
At the suggestion of Ray Gill, he sent it to E.P. Uh, Dutton. With the combined total of the 1947 hardcover and signet paperback from December 48, Ida Jury sold 6.5 million copies in the United States alone. Now, Ida Jury introduced Blaine's most famous character, hard-boiled detective Mike Hammer, uh, who, which has been played by numerous characters, actors over the years, including himself. We'll get into the Girl Hunters in a few minutes. Although tamed by some standards, his novels featured more sex than competing titles, and the violence was more overt than the usual detective story. Covers tended to feature scantily dressed women or women who appeared as if they were about to undress. In the beginning, Mike Hammer's chief nemesis consisted of gangsters. By, by the early 50s, this broadened to communists and deviants. Or a communist deviant or a deviant communist. An early version of Splane's Mike Hammer character called Mike Danger was submitted in a script for a detective themed comic book. Mike Hammer originally started out as a thought to be a comic book. I was going to have a Mike Danger comic book, Splane said in 1984. Two Mike Danger comic book stories were published in 54 without Spillane's knowledge, as well as one featuring Mike Lancer in 1942. These were published by other material in Byline, Mickey Splane, which came out in 2004. Down the Mike Hammer series proved so successful during the 1950s and 60s, the books were unfortunately... Uh, 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 thumbs down by the literary establishment. Malcolm Cowley of the New Republic called Spillane a dangerous paranoid sadist and masochist, and even his own editor sometimes found his novels distasteful. Spillane, for his part, was unmoved by critics, saying he can sell a lot more peanuts and caviar, and the literary world is made of second-rate writers writing about other second-rate writers. Attractively low prices, uh, 25 cents for a paperback, later raised to 50 cents, helped sales, and the 1956 informative guide, 60 Years of Best Sellers, found that six novels Spillane had written up to that point were among the top 10 best-selling American fiction titles of all time. I don't think it was selling a lot because it was cheap, it was just that good. Word of mouth will do everything. Now, the signet paperbacks displayed dramatic front cover illustrations. Lou Kimmel created these cover patents uh, for My Gun Is Quick, Vengeance Is Mine, One Lonely Night, and A Long Wait. The cover art for Kiss Me Deadly was by uh, James Meese. Now, ironically, he looked a little bit like Spencer Tracy and had that kind of low-key style. He eventually portrayed himself as a detective in Ring of Fear in 1954 and rewrote the film without credit for John Wayne's and Robert Fellows' Wayne Fellows Productions. The film was directed by screenwriter James Edward Grant. Several Hammer novels were then made into movies, including Kiss Me Deadly and uh, The Girl Hunters, which was filmed in England, which he uh, played himself. One of the few occasions in film history in which an author, a pop, or a literary hero has portrayed his own character. Now, he was scheduled to film The Snake as a follow-up, but that uh, production was never completed. Now, October 25th, 56, he appeared on The Ford Show, starring Tennessee Ernie Ford, with interest on his Mike Armour novels. In January 74, he appeared with the great Jack Cassidy in the TV series Columbo, uh, Peter Fox, a classic show, in an episode Publisher Parish. He portrayed a writer who was murdered. In 69, Spillane formed a production company with Fellows, who had produced The Girl Hunters, to put together many of his books. But Fellows unfortunately died soon after, and only The Delta Factor was produced. During the 1980s, with the revival of the Mike Hammer character in many genres, he appeared also in Miller Lite beer commercials. In the 1990s, Spillane licensed one of his characters to Tecto Comics for use in a science fiction adventure series, Bike Danger. His introduction to the series, Splane said he had conceived of the character decades earlier, but never used him. Now, again, uh, bad reaction uh, to uh, to the early work. Matt Cowley again also said he was a homicidal paranoiac. John G. Uh, Coetti called Spillane's writing atrocious, and Julian Simons called Spillane's work nauseating. I read his stuff; it's so tight you can't even touch it with an editor, and it's typical, typical. Mickey Spillane, like, if you're going to find a person that has no gay in him, it's Mike Hammer, Mickey Spillane. Now, by contrast, Ian Rand publicly praised Spillane's work at the time when critics were almost uniformly hostile. She considered him an underrated, if uneven stylist, and found congenial the black and white morality of the Hammer stories. She later publicly repudiated what she regarded as a main morality of Spillane's Tiger Man series. Now, 
Spillane's work was later praised by Max Allen Collins, William L. D'Andrea, and Robert L. Gale. D'Andrea argued that all Spillane's characters were stereotypes. Spillane had a flair for fast action writing, that his work broke new ground for American crime fiction, and that Spillane's prose is lean and spare and authentically tough, something that writers uh, like Ryman Chandler and Ross MacDonald never achieved. Now, German painter Marcus Lupertz claimed that Spillane's writing influenced his own work. Now, American comic book writer Frank Miller, one of his biggest supporters, has mentioned Spillane as an influence for his own hard-boiled style. Avant-garde musician John Vaughan composed a piece influenced by Spillane's writing, title, of course, Spillane. Now, he won a Lifetime Achievement Award in 1983 from the Private Eye Writers of America. He also received an Edgar Allan Poe Grand Master Award in 95. Now, uh... The, the Spillane family, Mary Ann Mickey had, he had uh, uh, four children, but he divorced in 62. In November 65, he married his second wife, nightclub center singer Sherry Malinu. After that, marriage ended a divorce and a lawsuit. In 83, Spillane shared his waterfront house in Murals Inlet with his third wife, Jane Rogers Johnson, who he married in October 83 and had two children. Now, uh, in the 60s, Spillane became a friend of the novelist Ayn Rand. Despite their apparent differences, Rand uh, admired uh, Spillane's literary style, and uh, Spillane became, as he described it, a fan of Rand's work. Later in his life, in a weird, weird uh, decision, he became an active Joel's witness. Now, uh, he really loved uh, Merle's Inlet and uh, died there of pancreatic cancer, uh, much too young uh, in 2006 because he had a few more years to go. After his death, his friend and literary executor, Max Allen Collins, began editing and completing Spillane's unpublished typescripts, beginning with a non-series novel, Dead Street. Now, uh, there was talk about naming a highway after him at US-17 near Murals Inlet, but it was uh, it was uh, passed out. So uh, the big Mike Hammer books, and if you have in your collection, it would draw a lot of memories. I Do Jury, My Gun Is Quick, Vengeance Is Dying, Mine, One Lonely Night, The Big Kill, Kiss Me Deadly, The Girl Hunters, The Snake, The Twisted Thing, The Body Lovers, Survival, Zero, The Killing Man, and Black Alley. Now, Many, many other novels were published, uh, short stories, even the young adult books that he did, late 70s, early, early 80s, and his short stories are still coming out year by year as we speak. Now, uh, The Girl Hunters uh, was banned from, I think, uh, most public domain Canadian channels for a while. I know CBC showed it once, and because of the excessive violence and sexuality in it, there was no editing, and according to Cole, calls of the local CBC, which was a story at the time, uh, it seemed in black and white that one of the major characters was nude for numerous scenes. I tell you no, it was a bikini scene, obviously, but I think he saw the woman naked and other people. Now, The Girl Hunters, again, is a British-made crime drama, uh, and was, some of it was filmed on NGM Studios. It was directed by Roy Rowland and adapted from the 62 book. So The Girl Hunters was put out in 62, movie came in 63. Exteriors were shot on location in New York City, with studio scenes done in London in 1962. So he wrote the book, and by the fall of 62, the book was a book to film, literally. Now, again, he plays by camera, one of the few occasions in film history in which an author played his own character. It also starred the very, very luminous Bond girl Shirley Eaton, who was in Goldfinger, veteran actor Lloyd Nolan, and syndicated newspaper columnist High Gardner as himself. Now, producer Fellows intended to follow the film with the snake, but it was never made. Now, uh, the movie has to be seen, I believe, is almost 100 minutes. It's crisp and black and white, your typical film noir. But the Spencer Tracy influence as his acting style, uh, it's quite interesting too because the character is a drunk, the character is frustrated, the character is horny, and the character is an egotist. And you spin this all around, and as the, uh, the movie goes on, he becomes more and more sober. It becomes more and more violent. Now, in the plot, ever since he's loved and lovely assistant Velda, great name for a character, has gone missing. Hammer has been drinking steadily and becomes a bum living on the streets. For seven years, within the, the timeline of Hammer, but it wasn't 
the Hammer character was like in multiple universes. You have to follow the books. For seven years, he hasn't been on a case in his that universe, in this book. But that changes when his former pal from the police, Captain Pat Chambers, asks his assistance on a job. Captain Chambers and Hammer were both in love with Velda, leading to an end of their friendship. In, in this case, the senator has been murdered, and Velda has disappeared. Now, Hammer is needed to talk with one Richie Cole, a dying sailor who refuses to speak with anybody else. According to federal agent Art Rickerby, not only has Richie been shot by the same gun used to kill a politician, he's actually an undercover federal agent. Now, this is where the plot gets true the bizarre. Hammer's investigation leads to Laura Knapp, the late senator's widow, built like a brick shithouse. She is beautiful but seductive. What a surprise in a Hammer book. But Hammer does not trust her. What a surprise. He learns they're all caught up in the fallout from a network of spies operating during World War II. Now her killer, nicknamed The Dragon, is trying to silence people who had some information about the spying. At the end, Hammer managed to find and kill The Dragon in a scene that is uh, basically uh, an off-screen crucifixion has to be seen to be believed. Uh, after this luminous death, he confronts Laura with his suspicions about her involvement. Laura fires a shotgun that Hammer had rigged to backfire in order to test her loyalty, and Hammer gets his answer. It is not clear at the end if Velda is still alive. Now, the movie itself uh, is kind of weird. He exhibits numerous examples of product placement when Spillane and Nolan share a couple of cans of Pabst Blue Ribbon. Ties out in with his beer commercials some 20 years later. Also during the first newsstand scene, one of the first times ever, Mad Magazine is featured, episode, uh, issue 77, uh, is showing on the newsstands when he's talking to his, uh, what he called, newsstand boy informant. Now, Spillane recalled meeting crime figure Billy Hill in London and invited him to the film set. According to Spillane, Hill provided firearms that were used in the film, and Spillane also noted that the producers surrounded him with actors who were shorter than he was. But Spillane was a, was a big guy. Now, what does Mickey Spillane's influence have on the current uh, film noir? Well, the last 20 years, film noir is pretty well being a dying... Uh, genre. You saw the last big gasp with L.E. Confidential with uh, certain uh, certain key movies like Seven, but Mickey Spillane uh, character was a hard nose uh, uh, what do you call uh, private investigator. Could Humphrey Bogart play, played Mickey Spillane? Of course not. Could Bruce Willis had? Like he has a little bit of a heft to him. It was almost like uh, like the, when the Quaid, uh, uh, the Keach brother played him. A uh, little bit of Darren McGavin. I think in the modern era, if he ever gets a little bit o older, uh, Chris Evans would do a great job. Spillane will show up one of these days when everything would me too and everything calms down. Because Mickey Spillane was a man's man. Like the famous scene with the nurse where he tells the nurse to lick, your, lick her lips and he comes back into the scene a few minutes later and he makes an aggressive kiss on her lips and she doesn't seem to be too turned off. You can't work down with the Me Too movement with this type of movie. However, five or ten years when we have a reversal of fortune where people are not so friggin' sensitive, Mike Hammer would make a comeback. But ladies and gentlemen, all I know if you, uh, the song Macho Man and Mike Hammer should have been put together. I wish there was somebody out there who could cut the Mickey Spillane Girl Hunters into a Macho Man song, like video, like put it together. So there's some scenes in the Girl Hunters. It's so subtle, it's almost hilarious, but it's not hilarious because he wrote the goddamn book. So, I mean, you can't make fun of the movie because he's the guy. This would be like me writing a story about growing up in northern New Brunswick with no paved road and uh, with no fridge, no heat. We had to make fire four o'clock in the morning and would follow me around, you know, for half the day where I'd be holding off my piss because the the road to my outhouse was frozen over and I had to shovel it. I would piss my pants while I was shoveling to my outhouse. That's my life. You don't want to watch that. But what Mickey Spillane or Mike Hammer went through, or Mickey Spillane or Mike Hammer, people want to watch that because, hey, that's interesting. You know, a lifeguard and pilot and, you know, comic book writer and, you know, Whoever touched, however touch God touches you as a writer. I was touched by a writer by God. So was uh, so was uh, Mickey Spillane. And boys, oh boys, oh boys. 
I don't understand why in the name of God NBC didn't do more with Mike Hammer through the years. Like that 4 and one that included Night Gallery in Colombo back in the day, it would have been perfect. But maybe they figured no women is going to watch. The only thing that come close to it was a Y50, but there was enough of a female aesthetic to Y50 to make people watch. But uh, I think uh, the Mike Hammer character could last more than 20 minutes because if, if the, his former friends are beating him up and the current girlfriends are trying to kill him, he's not going to last in the next case. And it's too bad Bruce Willis is sick because Bruce Willis never played uh, a, a major Mike Hammer, Mickey Spillane style character yet. If he gets better, that's kind of a possibility. But ladies and gentlemen, Chris Evans, maybe, 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 maybe uh, Ryan Reynolds or Ryan Gosling. You know, uh, Ryan Gosling has played film noir characters like in Drive before, but it takes a lot to play Mike Hammer. you got to be part Mickey Spillane. And Spencer Tracy would have been perfect, but he was too old. So Spillane probably said, and, and you know, uh, when he's talking to John Wayne, why don't you play it? He said, no problem, I'll write the book, I'll play it. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I think it was nine months between the book was written and the written the movie. Pretty freaky. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you like what we're doing here, we're screenshots, remote control. Give us a like, comment, or subscribe. And if you have a Mickey Spillane, a Mike Hammer book around the house, listen to this uh, podcast. Pass it on to your grandkids. Pass it on to your new wife or your soon-to-be ex-wife, and say, "Here, read I the Jury or read uh, uh, read the Girl Hunters." Or watch the Girl Hunters. And thank you, CHCH, for showing Girl Hunters this week. The only channel has the balls to show an old Mickey Spillane, Mike Hammer style movie. You're the last one left, so thanks for doing that. Thanks for listening. Bye.